All right. A very good afternoon to everyone present here, and welcome to this edition of uh, the Dot Talk Dot Talk webinar series. Dot uh, Talk is a platform uh, organized by Tetsu College, uh, which allows intellectuals, intellectual academicians, and you know. Uh, oh, okay, various specialists from around the globe to come and give us and express their opinions and viewpoints about about the various issues which concern our world okay, today. Uh, and uh, as we sit for this talk, I'll just quickly remind all of you that uh, kindly keep your microphones uh, at on mute. This is just to ensure that there is not much of sound disturbance as the talk goes on. Uh, at the same time, I'd also like to remind each and every one of you that there will be a question and answer round uh, at the end of the talk. So you can please feel free to uh, type in your questions in the chat window, and these questions will be picked up, picked up, uh, you know, as the talk uh, ends. All right. Uh, and uh, before I start the talk, I thought I'll just introduce the topic that we're here for today. Okay, media is a very integral part uh, of our life, and the abundance of news stories that are present in today's world can be quite confusing. Now, many theorists and analysts have uh, described our present situation as the World War C. COVID-19 basically is being described as World War C. Now, what is the difference between the World War II and World War C is that during World War II, there was a shortage of information. We had to wait for a number of days uh, to hear about how the war had gone on, gone on progress, whether these soldiers were safe or not. The world has developed a lot, but along with that has come a problem of an infodemic of misinformation, especially during this time of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there seems to be information coming at our ends from all corners. And we're not just talking about the particular forwards that we get on WhatsApp, home, you know, home remedies that one can do to get well. We're also talking about the various news channels and the bias which they contain as they present the news to us during this time. Talking about the state of the state of Nagaland, that is from where this talk is being is, you know, is is being organized. Our state over here does not have any news channels. So for instant coverage of the news, people in the state depend on social media outlets, Instagram, Instagram, WhatsApp. And through these channels, often what happens is that news which is not accurate gets spread, causing panic, causing chaos and pandemonium. Uh, an example of this was just a few days ago, there was an incident of the COVID-19. Our state had only one COVID-19 case, and uh, this person had traveled by an Air India flight. Subsequently, on WhatsApp, the entire passenger manifest was leaked out, and all the, all the people who had traveled in the flight, their phone numbers were leaked out on WhatsApp as well, uh, which led to several uh, of these passengers you know, receiving phone calls which harassed them and gave them quite a tough time. So we're also talking about uh, information which is getting misused in today's world. So it's not just misrepresentation of facts, it's also about uh, information which is which is getting which is getting you know misused and so today's talk takes a look at all of these issues this current uh, issue that is affecting the globe that is an infodemic of misinformation all right uh, and i'll quickly introduce our speaker for today uh, okay mr padma kumar is the head of the media studies department at Christ the Tube University Bangalore uh, he is a CIFL, CIFL uh, former student of of CIFL and prior to him joining Christ University he had also worked with Tekken Chronicle uh, and he has also presented it you know, presented in you know, he moderated various workshops and seminars uh, at the same time, he has also been published in newspapers like the Deccan Herald and the Hindu. His interests include culture studies, okay, ecological discourses, sports studies, as well as peace studies. So without much further, further ado, I would now like to hand over the time to our speaker, 
Don't be Mr. Padma Kumar, so you can please take your time. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anjan. Uh, it's such a pleasure listening to you, and uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, asking me to address uh, uh, Tetzer College on uh, the infodemic in the time of uh, pandemic. Um, <clears throat> let me also uh, tell me my uh, delight uh, in getting to know that uh, um, Erika and uh, uh, Hevasa are over there, and uh, uh, these are classmates of mine now whom I had met 15 years ago, and uh, it's a delight to know that uh, Anjan is working with them. Uh, by the way, Anjan had studied at Christ, and uh, he was such an enterprising student, and he continues to be one. And uh, thank you for arranging uh, such talks uh, and to ensure that academics continues despite the kind of challenges that we are facing. Thank you very much, Anjan. So let me step into the context. Uh, I hope you're presenting as well, uh, Anjan. Am I right? Is the presentation on? Yeah, you could start the presentation. Yes. So we are going to look at uh, infodemic uh, in the time of uh, a pandemic. Uh, uh, the side, uh, slide two, please. Yeah, the context in which this pandemic has unfolded, uh, unfolded uh, and uh, how infodemic challenge also has cropped up needs to be studied. What do we mean by the neoliberal edifice? One of the theorists claims that this is the ideology that dominates our lives in the present time and yet functions as though it has no name. We were able to name many other ideologies. We could name communism, we could name Nazism, we could name fascism when it was unfolding, and there was clarity that this is what is happening. But this neoliberal edifice is something that's so huge, it's an elephant in the room, but people may not be able to identify because of the ways in which it is set up. It promises freedom, it promises choice, it uh, reveres merit, uh, it insists on uh, competition, uh, but it will not talk about inequality. It will not reveal the political economy that it subscribes to and it uh, sponsors and it ensures that uh, sustains uh, the media complex. So it is obviously capitalist. Uh, it is market driven uh, and uh, designs the way in which our politics to our uh, media practices unfold. So that's something that we'll have to hold in the background. Let me move on to the uh, next slide. Here, I would like to uh, throw light on how our information ecosystem uh, is uh, set up. This is something that must be familiar for uh, most of those people in the communication media uh, domain. Uh, of course, uh, it's known for the four uh, Vs. Uh, uh, there are many Vs as well, but these are the ones that uh, most of the people uh, try to highlight quite often. Uh, I just thought uh, uh, this could set the background in a more concrete form. Uh, well, uh, there is a huge volume of information that we get access to. In fact, it's an avalanche of uh, information. Take, for instance, a number of Google searches per minute that uh, are done on a minutes basis. It's more than 50,000. Every minute, there are more than 50,000 Google searches that are done across the world. Imagine what would be in the context of half an hour, one hour, uh, one day, and the amount of data that would be fetched through these searches. And by the way, let's remember and remind ourselves that Google is not the only platform, search platform. There are many other ones as well. Google could be probably the dominant one. Then think about Facebook. Uh, it is almost one fourth of the world's population. And uh, at least uh, uh, 100 million people visit Facebook on a day to day basis. And then there are more than 500 hours of videos uploaded on YouTube every minute. Now, this is huge. In fact, there are communication media and technology experts who proclaim that the amount of data that we possess today from 2018 onwards is more than the amount of data that was produced from the time of human origin till 2018. So that would probably give us a sense of how much of data that is being produced. You might wonder why is that? Uh, as if people were not living, uh, as if people were not documenting, uh, you could ask questions about what was happening in the pre-2018 phase, let's say. Well, we are all part of the media today. It's not as though we are outside the media. We are media in a way. We are producing content for the media. So you could probably have a smoke fish in a bamboo tube, uh, and you might click a photo of that, and you might post it on your Instagram page. 
And now uh, this is going to be liked by many people. Other people could start responding to it. And that's how data is generated. And so there is a huge volume of data. And it's stored forever almost. Earlier, there was data production, but there was uh, no force to ensure that uh, it was retained, it was studied, uh, it was followed up. So this is one part of it. Then coming to the velocity part of it, the amount of uh, information that we have uh, travels at uh, a high octane speed. I'm guessing all of you are uh, pretty aware of it. Uh, so right now, I am sitting here uh, in Salem, a city in Tamil Nadu, and I'm addressing and I'm reaching out to people in Nagaland. And it doesn't take much time. Probably the lip syncing and uh, the video might not gel well. That's there. But then it's almost instantaneous. So that's the speed at which we are engaging. And this can happen uh, uh, between people in different corners of the world. So that's there. But uh, let's also uh, get to know that uh, people are no more concerned about just producing content and uploading it at a fast and, uh, speed. Uh, they also are concerned about uh, deciding at the same speed with, at which uh, the data is generated. Jeff Bezos, the uh, chief of Amazon, uh, was uh, telling his uh, colleagues in a meeting, uh, uh, being wrong may be less costly than you think, uh, whereas being slow is going to be expensive for sure. So he was asking them that even if you have 70% of data, just go ahead and take your decisions. You don't need to wait it out till you have 100% data for taking a call. So people are acting fast based on the data that is produced. So that's something that we'll have to consider in terms of velocity. There's a variety of uh, information uh, that is uh, there. There is plenty of variety. And uh, when you uh, check any media, see, think about it. Uh, think about your uh, father's or mother's uh, generation or your uh, grandparents' generation. The amount of information that we have access to and the amount of uh, variety that we have uh, is astounding. So I remember uh, when I was growing up in the 80s, uh, uh, all we uh, used to uh, have in the form of uh, television um, programs uh, was Chitrahar, uh, which used to be on Wednesdays or Fridays at 8 o'clock. So some songs would be played over there. And then uh, cricket commentary might be played uh, on uh, radio. So those are the ways in which we were engaging. But today, there is a huge influx. You have uh, all the celebrities coming and telling you what they do almost by the minute. Uh, you have their own Twitter pages. They have, you have their own uh, Instagram pages. So it's not just about celebrity. It's about almost anything and everything. There is so much of variety that uh, is there. That they produce it in different platforms, and they produce it in different ways as well. So variety is something that's very much there. But there is a problem when we come to the fourth one, veracity. While there is so much of a data, the authenticity of the data that is being shared uh, is something that becomes very, very questionable. It's not a concern just for the corporate. It's a concern for any nation. It's a concern for uh, any uh, citizen. It's a concern for anybody who's uh, living. Because there is so much of data that is produced, and not all of them are verified before being uh, posted or for the matter of uh, being shared with uh, the others. So these are things that we'll have to hold in mind. And by the way, uh, this does not unfold in the same way for everybody across the world. The volume of data that I might be getting, say, in Bangalore, is not the volume of data that you would be getting in, say, Nagaland. You know that uh, there is no regular uh, television platform coming from Nagaland. I am told that uh, uh, your audiovisual mediums, uh, I mean, uh, content about Nagaland uh, has to probably come from uh, the Northeast uh, Television Channel, uh, which is uh, from uh, Assam. So. That itself is an indication of how, uh, while uh, the others uh, in different parts of the world uh, could be splurging with the amount of uh, information that they um, have access to, uh, some parts of the world do not have ready access to information. And I'm told that uh, you have probably four newspapers in the entire state, whereas a city like Bombay uh, probably would have around 20 plus newspapers. So you can see the way in which uh, uh, the flow of information, the processing of information, uh, or the interpretation of the information is all dependent on uh, where we come from, uh, what are all the powers uh, that operate over there. So these are things that let's hold in the backdrop. So moving on. Now, all information does not qualify to be considered as news. That's something that I'm sure all of us are aware of. Uh, but then some of the other, uh, there is a mixing up. Uh, there is um, a strange. Uh, interrelation that is set up by the news industry, by the inter entertainment industry, in a way where it's not so easy to differentiate. For instance, uh, in the newspaper uh, domain, uh, 
they had introduced sometime in the post 2003 scenario something called the advertorials what is an advertorial earlier you used to have editorials and advertisements so advertorial is a mixing of advertising and editorials students of journalism would know that an editorial is a space in which any newspaper speaks out to its citizens and shares its opinions its informed reflections so those are things that unfold in the editorial page i'm sure uh, if you uh, check uh, the hindu or the statesman or the, uh, the hindustan times or the indian express uh, when you open the edit page uh, you will see an article stating the newspaper's stance on some of the pertinent issues of our time on a day-to-day -day basis it will be there now by coming up with something called as an advertorial uh, they speak on behalf of a particular company as though it is news and there is a small uh, font in which the title advertorial might be there and quite likewise they also have sponsored news which was uh, not there in the past so there are ways in which the idea of news itself uh, has been deliberately corrupted uh, and this is another thing that uh, i would like you people to uh, keep in the background okay so those of you uh, who have studied uh, chomsky uh, herman um, the seminal text that is manufacturing consent uh, consent would know that there are five filters of the media that they refer to uh, one is of course media ownership then the funding then the sourcing the flag and the common quickly let me explain uh, these things so the media content is not something that is decided by the reporters by the editors uh, by the sub editors uh, who are working in the organization alone uh, they do have a say but then uh, who is running the organization uh, has a huge say with regard to what is unfolding there see for instance uh, reliance uh, is owning plenty of media corporations today and if they are owning it how much of a liberty would those media organizations have with regard to questioning the ethics of reliance and its own set of organizations these are questions to be asked so by owning a company media owners get this liberty of not being studied not being investigated by the newsmen so this is one of the challenges that we'll have to uh, hold in mind then the funding where do news organizations get their funding from most of it uh, is from advertising that's a model that most of the organizations uh, run with and that's really a problematic model uh, fundamentally it is a flawed model if you look at from a democratic uh, principle it is a flawed model why see any newspaper which has around let's say 20 to say around 24 pages uh, uh, has to spend uh, almost around 30 to 40 rupees for just the printing alone forget about uh, the amount of money that they'll have to pay uh, their reporters uh, their uh, editors their photographers their designers uh, um, then uh, the people who work uh, in the uh, printing sector are uh, people who are uh, taking care of it uh, for transportation uh, and uh, all of them the transport i mean uh, the travel that is involved in going and uh, fetching news processing it so even if you leave that out just for the printing of a newspaper a single uh, edition of a newspaper you would have to spend around 30 to 40 rupees minimum okay so you get the newspaper for probably five rupees or six rupees, seven rupees, eight rupees, 10 rupees. So it's not even one third or one fourth of uh, the money that we are spending for it. So where does uh, the organization get the money to run a newspaper? Obviously it is from the advertisers. So advertisers do have a huge say with regard to how news content is prepared. So anything about the advertiser is not going to become news. So there you see that the corporates are given a kind of a leeway in terms of either media ownership or uh, in the form of the funding uh, that they um, work out for the news organizations. It's not just with the newspapers. It's the same with regard to uh, digital platforms at some level or the other. Uh, it's the same uh, with regard to uh, television uh, platforms and many, many other news platforms. Okay. Then the sourcing part of it, uh, news organizations have their own uh, beats. So they get news from those places uh, and suppose that that's authentic. 
supposing if somebody is wanting to uh, get information uh, from the prime minister's office, uh, there is a regular channel uh, established, and only through that they can fetch news from the prime minister's office. There are no other means. Most of it is shut. So it's not easy for, uh, it's not a transparent and it's not a um, easy entry for any journalist today. It's not just with regard to the PM's office. It's the same with the police station. It's the same with the court. So there are designated people through channels through which the news flows. Other sources are not considered to be worthy. And some of the other, over a period of time, journalists are trained to think that those are the sources from where uh, we can collect news. But that need not be the mechanism. That's the third part, the third filter that uh, Herman and uh, Chomsky talk about. Flack. Flack is a way of deviating uh, attention. See, you might have heard about Greta Thunberg. Uh, many of you might have uh, followed uh, her as well. Uh, her uh, school strike uh, for uh, bringing about, I mean, climate strike um, initiatives and all that, right? So quite uh, in a, quite a few uh, months, uh, there was another person uh, who was anti-Greta. Uh, and she became equally, almost, I wouldn't say equally, but then uh, she was in the news. And she was stating that all that Greta Thunberg uh, is speaking uh, for uh, is just a fallacy and that uh, she is propagating fake news. So they set up somebody else as a counter to ensure that what is true, uh, what is uh, coming across as important for people is now deflated. And that's another trick that is played to ensure that the core uh, authentic and significant news is diluted when it reaches the audience. So people are confused. Then there is this common enemy trick that uh, could be played out. So by talking about terrorism, for instance, we could avoid engaging with some of the core issues of our time. It's not to say that terrorism has to be encouraged. And uh, uh, it's not to say that terrorism uh, should not be followed by the news media. They ought to be. But then think about this. The number of people who die because of terrorism in our country uh, in a year uh, is rarely something that goes beyond, say, 200 or 300 or 400 max. But think about this. At least one and a half lakh of people die because of air pollution every year in our very own country. And that's something that has been poorly studied. And it does not become part of a political um, I mean, when uh, political parties say that these are things that we'd like to work on, this is something that does not figure in that agenda. So quite likewise, there are many, many other things that are so fundamental for our own existence, but they are not considered to be news because you create common enemies who would keep the audience engaged and thereby core issues can be uh, avoided. So that's another problem. Now, moving on. I think now we are stepping into a uh, core terrain, uh, information disorder. So there is information, of course, as I mentioned, uh, there is huge volume, velocity. Um, then uh, there is also variety. Those things are there. Uh, but there is a disorder uh, in the whole information ecosystem that is set up. And that is something that has to be studied. And it is in this context that we'll have to look at fake news and other uh, such uh, challenges. One is disinformation. Disinformation is nothing but false news. Conspiracy theories, for instance, are disinformation. Uh, um, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a disinformation. I'm sure uh, you've heard of this uh, old guy called uh, Donald Trump, someone uh, who frequently indulges in uh, a lot of uh, disinformation. So there was this theory that was circulating uh, before the uh, American election, uh, the last one. So it was supposed that there is this particular pizza house. Uh, and in the underground, uh, there was uh, it, it became a pedophile center. And it was claimed that it was a pedophile center. And uh, actually, they were, uh, and it was also tied up with uh, Hillary Clinton, as though she and her uh, uh, coterie of people uh, were involved uh, in continuing this uh, pedophile uh, business. So this is how the story was uh, flagged. And it was uh, spread across uh, in the media. And in fact, there was this guy uh, who almost came almost 300 miles from, I mean, uh, uh, from a far off distance, and he tried to shoot the people in that pizza house. And only when he went over there, and once the police arrested, investigation started, and they found out that there is no underground for that building. But the damage was done. Most of the people started buying into uh, that idea. And one of the recent uh, ones that uh, uh, most of you would be aware of, uh, uh, Trump uh, had. Uh, come up uh, with this brilliant, uh, bizarre uh, idea 
that uh, if disinfectants could be injected into the lungs of uh, those uh, who are having a uh, coronavirus they could be cured and he was proposing it in a press media and automatically there was a rise of disinfectant sales and some people were assuming that that was true so you can see the way in which uh, people can create confusion by planting such uh, ideas in the minds of the general public through the media that's one sort of the problem what is misinformation misinformation is as well false information but the only thing is here it need not be deliberate by mistake people could post such a an issue for instance a lot of uh, reporters today pick up information from twitter so if something is trending in twitter they assume i mean uh, they assume that uh, it could be true and if many people have retweeted it they start writing a story about it and they start looking at uh, uh, other uh, opinions about it and frame a story and put it in the uh, news platforms this has happened in the past and that's a form of a misinformation that's bad journalistic practice but that should not happen but the key thing is misinformation is false information but it's not intended to harm people it's done by mistake what is mal information mal information is right information but it is shared with an intent uh, intent to hurt people so mal information uh, uh, could also be deliberately used for divisive purposes i'm sure uh, some of you would have come across uh, many uh, stories about uh, the migrant uh, issue let's uh, go back to uh, trump land uh, the mexicans uh, are uh, people uh, many many uh, mexicans would love to come into america because of the economic prospects prospects that they could uh, have but they were painted up uh, as uh, problematic people so it is true that a lot of mexicans aspire to come to america but on the other hand the interpretation of that is done with uh, a sense of um, villainizing them so that's the uh, problem with mal information so this is how the information disorder uh, could be uh, created and some of them um, are uh, mastering such a, a, a practice okay so now that the context is set uh, let me go to uh, the pandemic and the uh, infodemic of course uh, um, here we'll have to be careful about the uh, word choice uh, it's a pandemic and not an epidemic epidemic is something uh, that uh, unfolds uh, and uh, explodes almost in a particular region uh, but a pandemic uh, is something that's across a larger entity uh, it's something that happens across a country or across a, a continent or the world and that's why covid-19 has been marked by the world health organization as a pandemic it has spread to uh, more than uh, 190 countries at least and that's why it's called as a pandemic right now the infodemic is also of a similar kind information that has viral potent and spreads to a larger sector of the society and you know the ways in which many many false information has started spreading i'm sure uh, many of you uh, would have read about the nizamuddin uh, case uh, uh, of course yes uh, the religious uh, meet did happen in delhi and it happened uh, prior to the lockdown uh, and uh, there were people from abroad and uh, there were uh, uh, also people from different parts of the state and by marking that as a super spreader and studying every one of almost every one of those uh, who attended uh, that particular event uh, the discourse was said that uh, many muslims are uh, posing this uh, danger to the rest of the country now this is problematic right did they go to the function yes i mean religious uh, meet yes they did attend that and uh, did they carry the virus yes and as tested uh, the many of them were found to carry that corona virus i mean the covid 19 uh, virus and that has been proven right but there was a statistical bias which was something that most people did not know about so everybody there were so many people who had gone to delhi and come back not everyone was studied the way in which the muslims who had attended the nizamuddin meet were studied so this is one kind of a, a problem so there were also other religious meets that had happened in different parts of the country but the same rigor of investigating uh, the people who went to those uh, fest was not carried out so you can see the ways in which uh, uh, this laid the foundation for many fake news to spread 
I'm sure some of you would have uh, come across this particular video of uh, uh, Muslims in a particular mosque uh, uh, licking plates and spoons. Yeah. Was that true? Yes, they did um, eat the food, uh, lick the plates and lick the spoons and they were depositing in one particular corner of the mosque. This is indeed true. But the interpretation was that these people were deliberately doing it to spread and the, sub, the interpretation was that these people already were carriers of the coronavirus and they were wanting to spread it to other people through this mechanism. So this was the interpretation that was given. And by giving this kind of an interpretation, uh, the uh, general public with the Nizamuddin uh, background started assuming that, uh, well, there is a hidden agenda with regard to why these Muslims are indulging in such a thing. But later, uh, fact checkers, as in the case of Alt News, uh, found out that uh, this was patently false. So how was it false? So this was a video that was uh, shot uh, sometime in 2016 or 17. Uh, and uh, this was now reinvoked in the COVID-19 context. And uh, it was presented as though they were deliberately trying to spread. So what were those people doing in 2016-17? Uh, uh, they were part of a Muslim sect called the Bora community, and these people uh, wanted to propagate the idea of zero food wastage. And that is a principle and a value that they have been cherishing for a very long time. So with that kind of an intent, uh, they did clear off even the uh, minuscule uh, food particle that was sticking to uh, the spoon uh, and then laying it uh, for uh, the cleaning purpose. So that's that was their intention. But reinterpretation, uh, misinterpretation, those things started happening in this COVID-19 context. So I hope you get a sense of how uh, infodemic can take shape. So infodemic, uh, I mean, the infodemic does not unfold naturally. It picks up on social ills that are already there in a society and starts exacerbating them. So it could be in the form of religious fundamentalism that is there. It could be in terms of uh, uh, the uh, economic inequalities that are there. It could be uh, in the form of uh, the caste uh, hierarchy that we have in the country. So it could pick up those things and play to the gallery of the majoritarian community. So that's the way in which uh, uh, the infodemic tends to operate. Why is this now becoming important in the pandemic context? That's another question that we'll have to dwell a little uh, on. Now, the pandemic uh, is a context where people are locked in their households. I'm sure most of you are uh, still having uh, the uh, lockdown uh, context. So this is something to be held in mind. And then there is a lot of confusion and there is no surety about uh, what is this virus spreading, how is it spreading, uh, and what is the cure. So even the best of the scientists, epidemiologists across the world are unsure about uh, why is it uh, happening? Uh, how is it happening? And uh, how could it be uh, resolved? So these are things that are very fuzzy at the moment, even for the best of uh, epidemiologists who are there. So I would like to invoke one of the quotes of Arundhati Roy, uh, who uh, had written a, a few, uh, I mean, probably in the month of March, I guess. So this was what she stated. Who amongst us is not a quack epidemiologist, virologist, statistician, and prophet? Let me repeat, who amongst us is not a quack, quack epidemiologist, virologist, statistician, and prophet? Now, I think this is very illustrative. So people have uh, half-baked ideas or have some amount of information or a lot of confusing information. And when they have this, they try to process it in their own limited ways and start playing the role of an epidemiologist. They start suggesting cures. I'm sure uh, many of you uh, would have uh, uh, heard some mechanisms, I mean, uh, some way of curing this illness in your own neighborhood. I'm sure your uh, um, neighbors or probably somebody in your family would have told you that do this, you will avoid this. Probably gargle uh, hot uh, salt water. This could cure, uh, I mean, this could be a good uh, preventive mechanism. So I'm sure many of them are stating this. Now, when this is shared in the social media space, it becomes even more dangerous. Why is it more dangerous uh, when it moves through the social media space? See, if it is the legacy media, when I say legacy media, the news media that has had an established career and usually has very stringent uh, 
uh, fact checking mechanisms okay so the legacy media tends to verify content before circulating it but when it comes to social media anybody can share anything uh, without much of a verification process involved and that's why they call us to be prosumers so we are no more consumers of information we are also producers and consumers of information and that's why the term uh, prosumers so as prosumers uh, we tend to uh, just quickly share the thinking that uh, this is something that's uh, interesting or probably shocking and so you share it so one of the uh, key things that needs to be done in this challenging context is to resist that urge to share and choose to verify and that's a very fundamental thing to do especially when it comes to sensational content the sensational content uh, operates in a very interesting form it picks on truths that are already very firmly established in the minds and the hearts of the people and tries to tweak that and tries to build on that so half truths and half lies come together to give a viral potent uh, and circulate in the form of fake news i hope you see the ways in which these things uh, operate right so the covid-19 context has plenty of confusion uh, there is a lot of doubt uh, and there is a lot of fear exploiting these things some mis mischief mongers bigots start sharing very problematic content and some of us who are naive uh, or vulnerable might be circulating these things and in fact uh, sometimes uh, i do have taken certain things to be true but uh, i resisted the urge to share because i wanted to verify so i'm sure uh, all of you uh, are capable of uh, resisting this urge to share before uh, posting any uh, content that is sensationalist uh, in uh, uh, nature so that's where i would like to stop uh, and i would like to field questions um could we have the yes yeah thank you so much uh, and i hope uh, i was able to add some value to your time thank you all right thank you so much uh, sir it was so nice to you know listen to you uh, for those of you who are joining in from my college over over here over here that's so college eight years back uh, sir used to teach me for five years that is for my ba and my masters uh, he had taught me and uh, it was always fun to sit in his class and today i got a preview of that a flashback sort of a thing as in uh, it was so good to good to you know listen to you once again and amidst the, the points that you had stated i think uh, one thing that i'd like to uh, stress on is this that currently the threat which we are facing right now in the form of this particular event okay pandemic uh, it is it is something which uh, of this magnitude i don't think the human society has faced such an such an event in in the in the you know, recent uh, times and so this is a completely new kind of a scenario which has built up and so it's natural in a way that's what people are saying and even i would want to see this way that people are panicking and amidst that panic they wish they are willing to hold on to any piece of news item that comes to them you know if it's drinking hot water which will save them they want to do that if it's having some kind of leaves which will keep them safe they want to do that basically they want to try trust and believe everything that's being thrown their way and that is why it's a problem uh, because they're not able to differentiate between what is genuine and what is not genuine uh, so that is what one thing another thing is which you pointed out in your talk is that the press uh, it depends on who owns that media channel or who owns the newspaper where they get the funding from i think that is this is more clear in the case of the us uh, you know the press in the us right now because half the press as we see are in support of trump and the other half are against trump or they are pointing out the flaws in the way that trump has been handling the whole the, this whole uh, time of situation in the us but again there is half of the newspapers which are in support of him news channels which are in support of the way that he is he, he is running things over there it's uh, quite less but it's definitely still there so uh, i think that's what i want to take away from your talk over here uh, one as we wait for questions to come in please feel free to uh, type in your questions over there as we wait for questions to come in i would also like to ask a question of mine uh, that is uh, in the case of uh, if we talk about the ideal world uh, in the ideal world we would want the press okay media to give us the absolute truth now according to you is this possible or is it just an ideal that we that cannot be achieved 
Okay, so um, I did mention that uh, the media is not uh, free. It is uh, chained uh, by the idea of profit. Uh, it's uh, run by uh, kind of a corporate and political nexus. Uh, that's something that I did uh, hint about. Uh, but uh, it's not to say that uh, there are no um, journalists who are doing a very uh, sincere and rigorous uh, work. Uh, there are uh, journalists who are doing a, uh, a stupendous work, uh, and hats off to them. Uh, uh, that is there, and it is possible to uh, run the uh, media in a different way. I think uh, there is uh, a great, uh, in this COVID-19, uh, by the way, uh, context also has uh, uh, brought the news media to its knees. Even Times of India, which is easily an, the largest uh, English newspaper uh, uh, organization in the world in terms of circulation, uh, is desperate for some kind of a support. So that's the uh, content. In fact, they had written to the Indian newspaper survey uh, along with uh, uh, many other uh, top newspapers asking uh, for uh, uh, the taxes uh, to be slashed when they buy uh, newsprint from uh, foreign countries. And apart from that, they have also asked for other support mechanisms so that uh, the news industry can function with some amount of uh, uh, strength. So this is there. Uh, it, it ought to be, I mean, the news industry, uh, in a way, uh, ought to be in the ICU. Uh, it is uh, the context, but then uh, they are putting up a gallant fight. Some of them are uh, putting up a very gallant fight. That's there. Uh, is it possible for us to realize an ideal kind of a press? Uh, well, uh, utopias do matter. Uh, we cannot take decisions based on our reality always. Uh, what we aspire for has to dictate how we function today. So. I think I would leave it there. Uh, it's not a, a convincing answer. I get that. But then uh, we'll have to keep our aspirations, especially when we are most challenged. And that's the way in which it, uh, the journalism industry ought to function. Journalists ought to be go-getters. And uh, mm -hmm. they ought to do it not just with regard to the search for news, but also for uh, survival. Yeah. All right. OK, Ms. Nisha has uh, posted a question. Uh, okay. She is pointing out to the fact, I think you can check in the chat window itself. Yes. Her question points out to the fact that various media channels and news channels were controlled by the government. There was a claim that many media channels were controlled by the government. And uh, they had even, uh, they at times would even receive threats. They had claimed that they were receiving threats from, you know, okay, from the government for having gone against or trying to speak you know speak against against the government so this kind of information okay this kind of uh, this kind of a disorder what should it be taken as okay uh, thank you very much uh, nisha that's a very important question to um, reflect on uh, and uh, let me try to address uh, in my own limited way um yes uh, the media has been going through a plenty of uh, credibility crisis in fact uh, People, I mean, by and large, the mainstream, uh, the public was not so concerned about uh, news because there was entertainment uh, that made so much more sense. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, when I say sense, uh, they were able to, they were trained to relate more to entertainment, and uh, they were happy uh, watching films and cricket matches and so on and so forth. Right. So news was not uh, something that made good sense for them. They didn't realize that for any uh, good democracy. The media, the news media is fundamental. So that was there. So already there was a sidelining of media context. And then, uh, as you rightly point out, uh, the media was also presented as uh, something that uh, cannot be trusted. Take, for instance, the way in which Trump uh, uh, almost uh, lambasted all the top uh, news agencies in uh, Europe uh, and also in the case of uh, America, particularly CNN, for instance. Uh, uh, BBC, for instance, he always uh, used to say that uh, they are the fake news factories. And so the kind of rigor that they had, the kind of fact checking that they had, would so easily be dismissed by the general public based on uh, what this person sitting in the hottest seat in the world uh, was claiming. Right. So this was the way in which the credibility crisis was set up. Uh, coming to the Indian context, uh, the problem has manifested in a different way. Terms like prostitutes, lip darts, um, seculars, I mean, uh, the people who were secular, uh, and then uh, the Lutians media, those kind of things uh, was floated. And there was also this Godi media uh, kind of term that was uh, used. And thereby, when people start looking at the media, they assume that uh, these are all a bunch of uh, um, journalists who do not 
be who cannot be trusted so the trust factor with regard to uh, the news media was indeed shaken and uh, you're right that even before covid 19 happened uh, this problem uh, was existing but during the covid 19 context there is an interesting shift during the covid 19 context people are in search of authentic news in fact we now get to see that news reading has gone up almost by 40 percent uh, newspaper sales is down but the way in which people are accessing news uh, has changed. I mean, uh, through the uh, e-platforms and other ones. And so people are looking for authentic, credible, reliable news. So uh, the credibility of uh, certain platforms is now getting boosted, though their survival is a challenge. So that is uh, the kind of context that we are facing. And uh, do governments pose challenges uh, to uh, news organizations? Yes, some of them uh, are owned by parties. And some, uh, media, as you would know, uh, uh, some of the News platforms are owned by corporates, some are owned by political parties, and some are uh, independent. Uh, uh, very few are uh, independent, uh, and uh, for them, existence is a challenge. You would know that uh, the way in which uh, uh, Siddharth Vardarajan, uh, the uh, editor of uh, The Wire, uh, uh, was uh, there was a case filed against him by the Uttar Pradesh uh, government pretty uh, recently. And uh, down south in Tamil Nadu, uh, there is this uh, person who uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to name the uh, news organization. I think it's Simplicity. Uh, so this is from Coimbatore. Uh, there was a person running a news platform called Simplicity, and uh, he had posted uh, some information about uh, the present government, uh, and which is not so problematic. Uh, but then uh, he was uh, targeted, and uh, he was put behind bars. So uh, threats that uh, the press face uh, are real uh, and uh, i'm sure some of you would have checked uh, just uh, two three days ago uh, we had uh, the world press freedom uh, uh, index uh, released and uh, india's rank uh, is uh, a very worrying 142 mm -hmm. so we are not doing great with regard to uh, our own credentials when it comes to uh, world press uh, i mean the uh, press freedom uh, uh, it's a matter of uh, serious concern yeah so i don't know whether i answer but i guess tangentially i did uh, try to respond uh, Misha. thank you for the question all right we'll quickly go on to the next question okay ishan has an interesting question okay sensationalism uh in the broadcast media of india that is the tv news channels heavily involved this method recently in the case of the bangar okay lynching case it's very obvious that the broadcast is run on the trp principle so is this very system flawed or can there be a different mechanism to go about it okay there are uh, i mean uh, now it's very very obvious uh, uh, many people would uh, already be aware of it but let me try to reiterate uh, some of the key insights that you can um, draw from uh, the broadcast media's practices so the broadcast media by and large unfortunately is dominated by a few uh, news makers so one of the fundamental principles uh, in journalism is that uh, we journalists should never become news. We should only be carrying news and uh, interpreting it and present to the public. But unfortunately, there are people who are desperate to become the news and they take a, a celebrity kind of a, a, a position almost. And in fact, uh, some of them tend to present uh, themselves as the news. So this is a, a problematic uh, context. So that's one form of a sensationalism that is uh, out there. And uh, what happens is in the broadcast media, they have moved away from reportage. So reportage uh, is the lifeblood of any good journalistic uh, platform. So they need to go out on the field, talk to people uh, who matter, gather the information, try to uh, process it, uh, and then share it with the general public. This ought to be the practice. But unfortunately, they don't do that. Uh, they find out who are the key noise makers and bring them to the uh, studio or through uh, a kind of a, a webinar, I mean, uh, uh, online uh, platforms uh, and uh, let them clash with each other. And this is something that is so dramatic that people get glued to it. And unfortunately, the people assume that uh, it is true as well. So this is a problematic model that is there. So they don't go out and do much of reportage. This uh, studio, war, uh, studio wars uh, unfortunately give us a sense of something to be news which is problematic so that's a uh, uh, major concern which we need to uh, definitely take that into account yeah uh, so they are indeed guided by the trps uh, so um, 
So they find out uh, who are the uh, audience that they have and what are their priorities, what are their value systems, what do they look for, and accordingly tend to stitch the news and then serve. That's a problematic uh, model. So Ishan, uh, those are my uh, thoughts on uh, the question that you posed. Thank you for that question. Let me All right, we'll yeah. quickly go on to the next question. Arthur Shnalam. Okay. Okay, he says critical thinking is most effective tool to discern fake news. Oh, that is from critical information, but yeah. it's quite difficult to ensure it at scale. Is there any merit in steering clear of the news entirely and focusing on information that is quite relevant to our immediate immediate circumstances? Does engaging with the news offer any real any real benefit? Okay, so there are. Uh, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Adarsha. It's a web of questions that you have posed, and uh, uh, let me try to um, uh, divide them and try to answer. Critical thing is the most effective tool to discern fake news from credible information. Uh, absolutely, uh, and uh, we have agreed on this on many, many occasions. And uh, yeah, so uh, there is no uh, doubt about it. But it's difficult to ensure uh, uh, the scale. Yes, you're right. Uh, India is a huge country and a diverse country. And the kind of literacy that we have uh, in general uh, uh, itself is a problem, uh, and more so when it comes to media literacy. Uh, we are not uh, medically literate. Uh, we are not uh, literate uh, uh, in terms of uh, law. We are not uh, literate in terms of many, many other uh, aspects. But media literacy, which is fundamental for any good democracy, is hugely lacking. But as I had already pointed out in um, some other context, uh, um, Education is the route through which we can probably promote media literacy. Scale, you are spot on, uh, is something that is definitely not convincing. What could do is, I mean, before, I mean, there are different ways in which we can look at it. Uh, of course, we need to empower uh, our uh, citizens to interpret and process news uh, with a critical acumen. Uh, that's there. Uh, but before that, uh, what could be done? I mean, until we arrive at that stage, what could be done is to ensure that the platforms are themselves responsible and only share information that is trustworthy, only information that is relevant, only information uh, that is verified. So these are things that platforms, uh, news platforms should take care of. Uh, every news platform should have a very rigorous fact checking uh, team. And without their uh, approval, no news should go out. So that should be a mechanism that we need to uh, think of. Uh, the next one, uh, does engaging with the news offer any real benefit well uh, it depends upon uh, where we are and uh, how we uh, see that our position our subject position decides whether it's important uh, or not but some way or the other uh, this collectivity that we are uh, as members of this particular nation does need a very rigorous engagement with news all of us do follow news but we might perhaps uh, put it on a, a hierarchy and uh, Think that that's more important this is not important this is irrelevant so we might do that but it's important for us to know uh, who is our uh, uh, local uh, counselor uh, who is our MLA it's important uh, uh, what they say about the unfolding things but some of the other uh, the discourse is designed in such a way that uh, the person who is sitting at the uh, top uh, uh, would decide everything and we'll have to depend on that model for uh, our own well-being so it has to be a decentralized kind of an engagement. I think uh, uh, news does have a lot of role to play in our own uh, context. Uh, there are tangent, uh, very uh, real uh, benefits that we would uh, get, uh, uh, provided we become a very rigorous citizenry. So that's my response. I know uh, it's not as simple as, as I've tried to present over here. But uh, yeah, as the collectivity, we need to move towards that phase. Thank you, Arnish. It's a very insightful question. Yeah. All right. Simon Verghese asks, uh, do you think that our vernacular media is acting as a boost to this madness of the infodemic? Okay, vernacular uh, media. That's another brilliant uh, question, uh, uh, Simon. Uh, uh, before I answer that question, uh, we need to establish the importance of the vernacular media. We are always trained to, I mean, most of us, uh, unfortunately, believe that uh, the English media matters the most, uh, but uh, most of the country is dependent on the vernacular media and they have a huge role to play. And they are uh, mightily influencing the ways in which people respond to any given context. So vernacular media has a huge role to play. 
and uh, is it acting as a boost to the menace of the infodemic? Uh, unfortunately, yes, because I've seen it in, uh, and they can be easily swayed. I mean, uh, they can be easily swayed because uh, they're vulnerable. Uh, well, that's debatable. Uh, some of them are, and some of them choose to because their sustenance itself is a challenge. The uh, corruption in the vernacular media is higher because their basic needs are not attended to, and so they become dependent on certain people for their own economic support. And so uh, they're willing to corrupt. So that's another problem, apart from them having lack of awareness about certain issues. Uh, this is another kind of a problem that is unfolding. And so um, unfortunately, the vernacular media in at least some parts of the India is adding to the menace of uh, infodemic. Yes, you're right. In, uh, observing that. Uh, thank you, sir. All right. As we're running short of time, I think we have time for one last question, a very quick question. So anyone who wants to ask a question can switch on their microphone and ask it. Otherwise, we'll wind up the session. If there's, if there's anyone who wants to ask any additional question, you can quickly switch on your microphone and go ahead and ask the question. All right. So since there is uh, there are no more questions coming in, uh, I would believe that we can uh, end our session over here. Thank you so much, everyone, for having joined us from different parts of the country. It's really encouraging to see that technology uh, is helping us come together during such a time and share our ideas, thoughts, and views, opinions. Uh, at the same time, a special thanks to the guest speaker Okay, Mr. Padma Kumar, uh, especially for me, it has been great because I was your, I was, I was, uh, I was your student eight years ago, and it's so great to see you on this platform, platform once again. And for the rest of us, I do believe that we have learned something, and we have, we have taken away something quite valuable from here. So thank you so much, all of you, and uh, we shall end our session over here. Thank you so much. Stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah. Anjan, uh, let me also thank Hewa sir and uh, Elika for uh, considering me for this particular uh, program. And uh, once again, uh, my uh, hearty uh, gratitude to uh, Anjan and to Getso College. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, audience. Uh, you had a pleasure to be along with. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.